Chapter 7, Sexuality. Sexuality is an important part of how we think about ourselves and how we think about other people. And there's few parts of our life where sexuality does not play a part. Now, to start with, we need to clarify some terms. When we talk about sex, we're talking about biological distinctions between males and females. So within about, you know, the first handful of weeks, sex starts to guide the development of the embryo. The male embryo has testosterone, which triggers male genitalia. And if there's no testosterone present, that's going to trigger female genitalia. Culture sets our standards for what we consider to be attractive, and attractiveness underlies our choices about reproduction. All of the people pictured here are considered beautiful in their particular societies. Now, both sexes have different primary sex characteristics, and at puberty, we develop our secondary sex characteristics. So our primary sex characteristics are our genitals and our sex organs, and our secondary sex characteristics develop during puberty. So for women, our hips get wider, develop breasts, and there's a lot more soft fatty tissue. Men develop more muscles in their upper body, extensive body hair, and deeper voices. Now let's clarify a little bit more terminology, okay? So intersex. These are folks whose bodies, including their genitals, have both male and female characteristics. It is natural, but it is rare. Transgender is people whose gender differs from the sex assigned at birth and who take steps to make their bodies and appearance consistent with their current identity. One or two out of every thousand people experience the feeling of being, quote, trapped in a body of the wrong sex. Many may choose to undergo gender confirmation surgery. Now, gender and sex are two different things, right? So sex is biological, although we now know today that our biology isn't quite as simple as male slash female either, right? But gender is a social construct. It's how we express our identity, okay? Um, it's not the same as sexual orientation. And it, being transgender differs from being gender nonconforming. Cisgender is the term that refers to folks whose gender identity matches the sex assignment that they had at birth. So if you were assigned female at birth and you identify as female, you'd be cisgendered. If you were assigned male at birth and you identify as male, that is also cisgendered. Now, sex and sexuality does have a biological foundation, but it's also very cultural as well. Cultures determine how much affection we show, what sort of sexual positions are considered, quote unquote, the norm. It, can, it determines notions of modesty, norms about sex before marriage or outside of marriage. Now, Alfred Kinsey is a very famous um, researcher who did a lot of research about sex, and he did this pioneering study in 1948. And some of the things that um, were found in this study is that in the U.S., most people have sex in this face-to-face -face position that we call missionary, okay? But it's called missionary because when missionaries went to the South Seas, they learned of this position from the missionaries and they poked fun at them for their strange missionary position when having sex. Now, since sex is a cultural issue, it also means there's taboos, right? And those might vary from culture to culture. Although there is one cultural universal taboo and only humans observe this. Other animals and species don't observe this, okay? And that is a norm that forbids incest sexual relations or marriage between certain degrees of relatives now which family members are included how far apart your relational distance has to be varies based on culture and then of course varies based on the law as well and what's the reason for this the reason that probably gets cited the most is biology right that like oh if you have sex and have a baby with a relative of yours your baby's gonna have biological issues Right. And that certainly can be true. Um, there is a family that 
is, um, and I should have looked this up before I started recording, but if you Google it, there's a family that is, uh, I think they're called the quote, quote, most inbred family. And there's a lot of like cousins and siblings that had children together. And there are a lot of biological defects or issues within those offspring. But there's other reasons besides the biology, right? So it's, first of all, there are those risks, especially if, you know, your family carries, um, you know, some kind of gene that puts you at higher risk for something, illness, you know, I don't know, whatever. Then obviously if you reproduce within that same family, right, you're upping the odds of those genes being passed on. But it's also part of social organization. Think about how confusing our society would be if people were dating within their families and having families within their families, right? So you would be like your uncle and your brother, right? So it limits sexual competitions in families. Family ties define our rights and our obligations towards each other. And it helps integrate the larger society because you go out and you find a mate outside of your family. Now, one fun fact, I guess, about this topic is that with the advent of 23andMe and Ancestry DNA, people are finding out that there's a lot more incest that took place in the world than we previously thought. Um, and people are finding that out because they have, um, you know, either genetic matches to a family member um, that are different than what they thought, or the percentage of DNA is sort of off. Uh, now, some of this can be because um, someone gets adopted and no one ever knows the circumstances of that. And maybe that is a child that is a product of a sexual assault. A father sexually assaulted a daughter. The daughter became pregnant. They had the baby. They put the baby up for adoption. Um, and it could be as a result of, um, con I don't want to say consensual incest because that sounds weird. But um, so it could be the result of like sexual assault. It could also be the result of, I guess, choice. So thinking about sexual attitudes in the U.S., I think we think of ourselves as a very free country. But if you compare us to some other places, um, we're still a little puritanical here. So we are both restrictive in some ways and permissive in other ways. We still view sex as a strong indicator of people's personal morality, although the culture has changed in my lifetime. And we're hearing people like talk about don't slut shame people. Right. And that as long as people are engaged in consensual, healthy behavior, um, you know, is it really any of our business? By the same token, we use sex to sell almost every product in this country and we exploit it and it's glorified in our culture. Now, last century, we see these big, big changes in attitudes and practices. So in the 1920s, people start migrating to cities and they're living away from their families for the first time. And that provides some greater sexual freedom. Um, you know, in the decades before this, when you dated, someone like came to your house, um, you know, parents might have chaperoned it. In 1945, Kinsey begins his study and he publishes his study three years later. And this sets off a national discussion. And they figure out that people are not as conventional as they thought they were. Right. Kinsey is also the person responsible for that one in 10 statistic that one in 10 people um, are probably gay um, or bisexual. And Kinsey also found that if you think of sexual orientation as a continuum with like 100% straight on one end and 100% gay on the other end, that very few people, despite many people identifying as like holy one or holy the other, that they often are not, that most people are somewhere on that continuum, that probably only 10% are on each end of that spectrum. In 1960, the pill is introduced. The pill is so important, I don't have to tell you what pill it is. It's the birth control pill. We just call it the pill. Also during the 60s, youth culture dominates. This is a counterculture. If it feels good, do it. And the baby boomers are the first cohort to grow up with the idea that sex is part of everyone's life, whether they're married or not. Now, 
Now, the sexual revolution is especially important for women. Women have been throughout history subject to greater sexual regulation than men, right? So we have a double standard in our culture. Men are encouraged to be sexually active and women are expected to remain chaste until marriage, right? Or at least keep the number of partners you've had low. And the sexual revolution changed behavior overall, but certainly narrowed the double standard gap for women. And so as opportunities for women increase in general, there is greater openness about sex as well. With every revolution comes a counter revolution. So in the 80s, that climate of sexual freedom starts being criticized. It's evidence of our moral decay. People are also talking about the breakdown of the family and divorce as evidence of moral decay. Um, And so this wave of sexual freedom begins to recede. We also start having a great fear of sexually transmitted infections during this time period. And mostly because this is when the HIV virus is identified. Okay. And so initially nobody knows what's causing it. Initially they call it gay cancer because what they're seeing is, as you probably are aware, right? HIV is a disease that breaks down your immune system. And so then people often get very sick or die from diseases that we either don't see that much or people don't get super sick and and die from. And that's because your immune system has been um, broken down. And so what they were seeing was this particular type of rare cancer and they were seeing it in a lot of gay men. So they thought it was gay cancer. So we start having this conservative call for family values. That's something that's talked about a lot in the 80s and sexual responsibility. Now, how much has sexual behavior changed since the sexual revolution? So in Kinsey's study, 50% of men and 6% of women had premarital sex by the age of 19 amongst those born in the early 1900s. This would be like your great grandparents. My uh, my grandparents, uh, my dad's side of the family, my grandpa was born in like 1913. My nana and my mom's side of the family was born in 1925. Okay, so not even your grandparents' generation before that. Okay. Now, people born in the 70s, that's Gen X, that's my generation, 76% of men and 66% of women had had sex by their senior year in high school, okay? So clearly, like, premarital sex is becoming much more common, but part of that is also our ability to control reproduction, right? There are are fewer consequences for women, like you're less likely to get pregnant because the pill exists, condoms exist, right? You have lots of um, ways to manage that. Also in 1973, abortion becomes illegal. Now, sex between adults, right? The frequency varies widely widely across the U.S. population. 26% of adults did not have sex during the past year. 9% had sex once or twice. 12% said once per month. And about half said two times a month or more. There's no generalization we can make about like sex in America that's going to hold true across even like a large group of Americans, right? And probably a more accurate way to think about sex between adults would have more to do with like how long term people have been in a relationship together, whether or not people have children, right? Like what their lifestyle kind of looks like. Now, extramarital sex, otherwise known as adultery, used to be illegal and you could get the death penalty for it. And it's widely condemned. I think you'd be hard pressed to find many people who are like, yeah, you should cheat on your spouse. That sounds like a good idea, okay? This is a strong part of our culture but our actual behavior really differs. Um, I wanna say amongst married people, it is 25% of men cheat in a marriage and 10% of women. Now, this is a good example of statistics, right? The flip side of that is 75% of men in marriages are faithful, right? That's a much more positive view of that and 90% of women. Now, of course, patterns change over time, right? Um, By our mid-20s, more than 90% of both women and men report being sexually active with a partner at least once in the past year. Young adults reporting the highest frequency. Adults in their 40s, um, about 64 times per year. And adults in their 70s, about 10 times per year, right? Now, some of that's biologically driven, right? So for young men, your sex drive peaks kind of around 18, 19, 20. For women, it peaks like in their 40s. Women's sex drive continues to climb until menopause. 
Um, and so, of course, like, it makes sense that young adults are reporting the highest rates of sexual activity. Now, thinking about sexual orientation, right? So we talked about sex, which is a biological component. We talked about gender. That's a social construct. And even how gender is expressed has really evolved and changed over time. I think I told you guys in a previous lecture that, um, you know, things that we think of as being feminine today. So like high heels, dresses, the color pink. Those are all things that used to be reserved for men in the past. Um, also, even things like name. So my first name is Meredith. Meredith used to be a masculine name. Um, I don't know any dudes named Meredith, but I do know a handful of other women named Meredith. Right. So things kind of change over time. Um, <clears throat> so heterosexual refers to people who have opposite sex attraction, homosexual, same sex attraction, bisexual, both. Asexual are folks that have no sexual attraction to people of any sex. And pansexual refers to people who um I, being attracted to people who identify as male, female, or any type of sexual identity. Now, obviously, if this was a course on sexual orientation, and the college does have an upper level social course on this, that's, um, I think it's like gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender issues, something like that. It's 300 level class. I definitely highly recommend it. Um, you would spend more time. You could really get into this. We know that this is not the end all be all. People um, define their sexual orientation in many ways. Some people would define themselves as someone who's only sexually attracted when they're in love with the other person. And Kinsey says these are not mutually exclusive, right? Most people, whether they admit to it or not, have some attraction towards people of the same sex. And many people may act on that. Now, the flip side of that is you can be homosexual and never have had sex or kissed someone of the same sex. You can also have kissed someone of the same sex or had sex with them. And that doesn't mean you're gay. It doesn't mean you're bisexual. doesn't mean you're pansexual. So sexual behavior, sex, gender, sexual orientation, all different things. Where does our sexual orientation come from, right? So for a very long time in my lifetime early on, people really, and not even early on, like people really felt strongly that it was a choice, that gay people were just choosing this, right? Like they wanted attention and they're just choosing to be gay. Um, I think if you think about how difficult it is for someone who is not cisgendered and not heteronormative, how difficult it can be in the world, makes it pretty clear that it's not a choice, Right. So one argument is it's a pattern in society. Right. So just like anything else, that's a social construct. Right. Up until about 100 years ago, we didn't have distinct categories of people known as homosexuals and patterns varied from culture to culture. So in New Guinea, they used to have a ritual in which young boys performed oral sex on older men in the belief that ingesting semen enhances their masculinity. OK. And that was part of a ritual or a cultural right. It had nothing to do with sexual orientation. Now, the biological argument would say that this is somehow biological. We have not discovered a gene like, oh, you got that gene. That definitely means, you know, you're going to be gay. You're going to be bisexual, right? <clears throat> but perhaps there is some genetic component to this. Maybe it's brain structure, right? And more evidence points to this being biological, although certainly cult our culture plays a role on that. And, um, you know, our culture may be playing a role not so much in... Um, you know, influencing people to be gay, but maybe in influencing people to not realize they're gay or to not express that, not feel like they can act on it. So as I mentioned, it's difficult to figure out like how many people are not like straight, right? Part of this is not everybody's willing to talk about this stuff. This can be very private, right? You guys have grown up in a time where I think people are much more open about this. The process of coming out is less um, arduous. Some people just kind of from the get are like, yeah, I like boys and girls or yeah, I like girls, right? Um, but sexual orientation doesn't fit into neat categories. A lot of people don't figure out that they have same sex attraction till later in life. Um, and some people just aren't willing to tell you this, right? And for some people, it's not safe to be out. They might live in a part of the country or a part of the world or in a family where it is not safe. Now, Kinsey had estimated 4% of men and 2% of females had exclusive same-sex orientation, okay? 
and uh, about a third of men and one eighth that should say of women have had at least one homosexual experience leading to orgasm. Okay. Uh, by the way, that's okay. So the first one is an estimate based on data that Kinsey gathered. The second one is a statistic from the data Kinsey gathered less than 1% describe themselves as bisexual, but bisexual experiences seem to be very common. And more recent surveys put this at about 10% of the population is not straight. And here we can see a little chart, right? So you can see here, right? There's reporting homosexual activity and then there's claiming um, a bisexual identity, right? So like someone might identify as straight, but have engaged in non-straight behavior, right? And then we have claiming a homosexual identity. So notice the number of the percentages of people who state that they're bi or homosexual is much lower than the number of people who've engaged in same-sex behavior. So in 1973, okay, so just to give you a little um, placement for that, because I know the 1900s feel really old to you guys. I was born at the very end of 1972, so this is like basically the beginning of my life. Three quarters of adults said homosexual relations are always wrong. In the year 2000, less than 60% of people feel this way. And I would assume it's even low, uh, you know, lower than that today, right? So part of these changes come through the gay rights movement, right? So up until the 1960s, people didn't discuss homosexuality. My Nana told me a story once. She told me this way later in life. Obviously, she didn't tell me this in the 60s because I didn't exist in the 60s. Um, but my Nana had told me a story about how she had a cousin. And she kept telling me how her cousin, her male cousin, lived with his mom his whole life. And how he was very nice. And she just kept repeating, like, he was very nice, Meredith. He was very nice. And I'm like, okay, that's great, Nana. Your cousin was nice. And then I was like, oh, do you mean he's gay, Nana? <laughs> right? Because, like, people didn't talk about this stuff. And my Nana so doesn't care about that kind of stuff. But she didn't have the language for it at that point in her life either. Um, so it was common to fire people who were accused of being gay. Up until um, 1973, the DSM considered it a mental illness. Okay. And by the way, there were all kinds of laws. Like you could be institutionalized long term for uh, being gay. Okay. And so through the gay rights movement, part of what we see developed too is the term homophobia right that is used to describe the dread of close personal interaction with people thought to be gay lesbian or bisexual all right so now let's talk about some sexual controversies so transgender athletes right this actually just came up with the olympics somebody accused a female wrestler who was assigned female at birth and identifies as female now does not even identify as transgender somebody accused her of being a man and trying to compete against women so that she would win uh, and that kind of became a big deal here but there has also been stuff in the news recently about what about transgender athletes what is going on in terms of like protection for them in terms of can they compete? What does this mean in terms of competing like at the collegiate level or professionally? So Leah Thomas is a transgender woman. She became eligible to compete on Penn's women's swim team and her success raised questions about fairness in women's sports. And so sometimes people call for like, oh, well, let's test people's level of testosterone and that will determine, you know, are they male or are they female? But some women have high levels of testosterone and identify as women and biologically are women. Um, so this isn't like we don't there's no like test of like, boom, you're a man. Boom, you're a woman. Woman. We can see laws around women, um, sorry, transgender women and women's sports across the United States, right? And laws have really been in flux recently as well. So for a while, we were moving in the direction of more protections for trans folks, things like gender neutral bathrooms. And now in some states, we're really taking some steps back and it's becoming unsafe again. But you can see here, right, that the states with polka dots in them have enacted a ban on transgender women participation in sports as of two years ago and the orange ones don't have bans right mm -hmm. 
teen pregnancy. One thing to know about teen pregnancy when you look up the data is that the statistics generally are teenagers 15 to 19. That's what the Census Bureau tracks. So one thing to remember is that teen pregnancies include people who are 18 and 19. And well, yes, those are teens. And yes, that's young to have a child. Those people are legally adults. So our numbers on teen pregnancy are a little murky. Also, the number of teenagers who get pregnant is not the same as the number of teenagers who have babies. Not every teenager who gets pregnant chooses to have that baby. Okay. But there's roughly just under half a million teen pregnancies in the U.S., most of which are unplanned. And this rate has declined since 1990, and it's way less stigmatized now than it was in the past. Um, and if you go back further in time and look at like when your grandparents had kids, right? So your grandparents would be like my parents' age. My mom was 20 when I was born. My dad was 19. And while that was a little bit young for then, right, it also wasn't the same as like a 19, 20 year old getting pregnant now. Here we see some teen pregnancy rates, right? So notice the orange states have the highest ones. The green ones have the lowest ones, right? Look at us, go New England. Okay, pornography. What do we mean by pornography? This is sexually explicit material that causes sexual arousal, okay? Um, now, this is murky water because how we define obscenity the Supreme Court did a terrible job at this. They basically said that anything that violates community standards of decency and lacks redeeming social value is considered obscene, which means local areas are allowed to make that decision. And so there are some places in the country where you could not send somebody, I guess you don't have catalogs anymore, right? but these have like catalogs of like adult toys, right? Things that now you get on Amazon. Um, and there were places in the country where you couldn't send that. And I don't mean crazy and more risque things. I mean traditional things that many people use. Okay. Pornography also, back in the day, right, you had to like go to a special bookstore to rent a video or buy a video. Okay. Today, pornography is available on the internet. It's super easy to access. You don't even always have to pay for it. Okay. This is a $15 billion a year industry. Now, some people have concerns that pornography is uh, encourages rape, encourages sexual assault and violence against women. And certainly some pornography is concerning, right? But not all pornography encourages violence against women. Prostitution, we refer to this as sex work today. Uh, this is the selling of sexual services. One in five adult U.S. men have paid for sex at some time. Okay. Now there's varying degrees of this. You can have like high end elite uh, call girls who cost, you know, hundreds of dollars a night. Right. Um, and then you've got people who like walk the street and have a pimp. Okay. Now, many people consider this a quote unquote victimless crime. Right. Because um, Everybody has consented, presumably. If it's a minor, the minor hasn't consented. It's also not prostitution if the person is a child. That's trafficking, okay? Prostitution, though, does subject many women to abuse and violence. It spreads sexually transmitted infections. And a lot of this is because it's not regulated. Um, and many women will get a pimp when they're a sex worker because... Um, they think it makes them safer, but having a pimp actually makes you less safe. And again, you, we could do a whole entire semester on sex trafficking. We have in the past, by the way. Um, sexual abuse and violence. Again, we have a whole course on this, so we're just getting like one slide on this, right? This is everything from verbal abuse to rape and physical assault. Just want to make sure I clarify something here. Um, Consent is required for sexual contact with people. If there is no consent, it is a sexual assault. Sexual assault is an umbrella term that includes everything from kissing someone when they don't want it to penetration. Rape refers specifically to penetration without consent. Force does not have to be involved. If you lack consent, it is not sex. Sometimes people will say things like non-consensual sex or an inappropriate relationship with a minor. That is a sexual assault. Okay, if there's no consent present, it is not sex. 
many people think like, oh, that guy couldn't have possibly raped somebody like he's so handsome and he doesn't need to rape in order to have sex. Rape is not about sex. It's about power. OK. Um, now, the government used to define this as carnal knowledge of a female forcibly and against her will. In 2012, the government changed that. So up until 2013, if you look at government statistics on rape, it's only women as victims and only when force has been involved. Now, I think you guys are not as familiar with this term, but when I was your age, people talked a lot about date rape. Um, and that's because most people's concept of rape was sort of a more stereotypical rape, right? Like a man jumps out of the bushes, he holds a weapon against you, it's violent, you end up with an injury. Okay, that is very small amounts of rape. The overwhelming majority, overwhelming majority of sexual assault occurs between people who know each other and... That sort of sexual assault, when it was first being discussed nationally, was referred to as date rape. OK, um, it's a bit of a misnomer because it sounds like you went out on a date and that might not have happened. Right. It could be you're at a party. Um, someone doesn't take no for an answer. Right. And many people don't realize, by the way, that when they've been sexually assaulted, that they have been sexually assaulted. People often feel like, oh, it must have been a misunderstanding. Um, this person would never do this to me. But in reality, you are in the most danger from somebody you know and trust. Now, abortion refers to the deliberate termination of a pregnancy. OK, a miscarriage is technically a spontaneous abortion. OK, and if you were pregnant and um, didn't and miscarried and didn't fully miscarry right so part of the fetus or the fetus is still inside you you would have the exact same procedure done to remove that okay um now 1973 we get roe v wade and that gives a woman the right to choose and in 2012 the supreme court with some legal mumbo jumbo that doesn't make any sense and doesn't follow precedence um, has chipped away at this and there are many political candidates who are hoping to chip away at it even further. So in some states now, they're telling you you can't um, terminate a pregnancy after six weeks. OK, most women don't even know they're pregnant. Um, six weeks, by the way, when we determine how many weeks pregnant a woman is, it starts with the first date of her last period. It doesn't start with the actual date you got pregnant. OK. So if you got pregnant on like April 10th, but your period started on April 6th, April 6th is your first date. OK. Also, there isn't a heartbeat at that point at six weeks. You think there's a heartbeat because the ultrasound makes noise, but that's not a heartbeat. It's sound from the ultrasound. OK. Here we can see some information about um, women's access to abortion across the globe. Right. Notice that the United States is in big old pink right now because we're kind of all over the place. Now, Massachusetts is a state that has guaranteed in its constitution a woman's right to terminate a pregnancy. All right. So let's pop back to our theory, structural functional theory, symbolic interaction, um, social conflict. And let's think about how these would look at sexuality. So remember our structural, functional and position. I don't know why I can't say structural, functional together, right? Is looking at what purpose does a pattern, does an institution hold in our society? And so one thing to think about is we highly regulate people's sexual behavior, right? Um, if we gave people free reign, that would threaten family life and threaten how children are raised. Now, I'm not sure this is as problematic as some people think it is, right? So we used to refer to families where the mom and dad were no longer together. So they were divorced or they never got married and then they split up as quote unquote broken homes. We don't do that anymore because that is many, many, many homes, right? Many folks. Um, my sister has a kid and my brother has three kids and none of my mother's children are married. Okay. So and they weren't married at the time, right? Um, so today that's a little bit different than it was 10, 15, 20, 20, 30 years ago. Okay. A lot of control over sexuality has to do with childbirth. So a lot of reason why men have historically controlled 
women's bodies. One is to ensure that the children that are being born into a marriage actually belong to that man. Now, this is pre-DNA testing and stuff, right? Um, and also, it's a method of controlling women, right? As we develop technology to control birth, society becomes more permissive, right? And we move from basic forms. Uh, so sex moves from just being a form of reproduction to really being a form of intimacy and recreation. And by the way, I haven't studied this in a long time, so I don't know where the Catholic Church stands on this anymore. But when I was in college 25, 30 years ago, the Catholic Church's position was that the only purpose for sex was procreation. Okay, so if you got married and you're Catholic and you do not intend to have children, you're not supposed to have sex. Now, I don't know, maybe the Pope's come around on that, but. Okay, so what are some latent functions of sexuality, right? Let's think about the latent function of prostitution. Why does prostitution exist, right? So it meets the needs of people who might be traveling or soldiers or people who don't have ready access to sex, right? Mm -hmm. People who might have trouble establishing relationships. Um, the availability of sex without commitment might stabilize some marriages that would otherwise collapse. Now, today we're seeing more people move to these polyamorous, right, or open relationships where that's an agreement amongst the partners um, that we're in a committed relationship to each other in every other way, but that perhaps we're allowed to have sex outside of that relationship. Um, but for a long time, that was not an option. Okay, so remember, symbolic interaction is really looking at how do we construct our reality. Um, and so all patterns of sexuality have changed over time. If you have the kind of parents that you can talk to about this, like talk to them about what their high school experience was like, right? So when I was in high school, to my knowledge, I went to a Catholic high school, but that's not really the reason for this. But to, when I was in high school, there was nobody who was out in my high school. Nobody was gay. There were rumors that maybe some people were gay, but nobody was gay, okay? Since then, since Facebook, and I've been able to reconnect with all kinds of people. Yeah, guess what? A whole bunch of people I went to high school with are gay and are married to women or married to dudes, right? They were always gay. It just wasn't a thing that was kind of allowed when I was a kid or it was secretive, right? Um, the importance of virginity has changed over time, right? We don't often think of women as like um, not marriage material because they've had sex, so at the beginning of a century, it's very important, right? It's the only way you can assure that your wife is not carrying someone else's child. But amongst people born between 63 and 74, so that's the beginning of Gen X. Gen X goes up to 1980. 16% of men and 20% of women were virgins at marriage, right? So that number has dipped down a lot, but still pretty high. Okay. Now, in other places in the world, people have different thoughts about sexuality, right? So like in some cultures, adults don't pay a lot of attention to when children experiment sexually with one another. And by the way, a certain amount of quote unquote playing doctor is normal and developmentally appropriate. Some of it is not, right? But some of it is normal. You show me mine, I'll show you yours. Um, but some parents really freak out when they see that. They don't understand that that's kind of normal. Other things to think about, right? Male circumcision is very common in the U.S. right now. In the Jewish faith, it's part of that faith ritual um, and rites, right? But also many men in the U.S. are circumcised. Again, I think this is going to break down along um, generational lines um, because I know like amongst my generation, Gen X, most men probably are circumcised. My... Um, I have family members, though, who have had sons and did not circumcise their sons, okay? But female circumcision is rare in the U.S., common in other places. Now, female circumcision is meant to limit women's um, pleasure. But male circumcision also limits men's pleasure because the part of the foreskin that's removed has a lot of nerve endings. Okay. Now, social conflict, remember, is going to look at inequality, right? So sexuality does reflect social inequality, quality, right? So when we t think about who gets arrested for um, like sex work, right, we're more likely to arrest the female prostitutes than the male johns, okay? Um, as I mentioned, there's, um, there's a book called Sex Crime Panic, which talks about how the laws we use today to like long-term incapacitate and civilly commit 
people who have serious uh, mental health issues and serious sexual offending issues used to be used to commit people who are gay. Um, the word pornography comes from the word porn, meaning a man's sexual slave, right? Most pornography depicts women pleasing men. Um, and a lot of pornography, the way women respond is not real or accurate, right? Um, a lot of the terminology we use in our culture about sex reflects violence or sports, right? Did you score? You banged? You hit on someone? Okay. Now, there's also politics around sexuality, right? So conservatives wish to conserve the past and tend to resist new patterns, and they tend to view sexuality in moral terms. Okay, when you look at a lot of these laws around gender orientation, um, access to birth control and abortion, right, the restrictive laws are being pushed by conservatives. Okay, progressives seek to move away from the past to progress in society. They tend to view sexuality more in terms of inequality and feel like the past has a history of oppression. 